Welcome, Movement Nation. We want to thank you for tuning in to this week's message. Listen, friends, over the last few weeks, we have been dealing with uh, the aspects of our family of origin that are dysfunctional. We've been dealing with the narrative scripts in our lives, uh, narrative scripts that have come from both our maternal uh, father, uh, maternal uh, mother, as well as paternal father. We've uh, looked at generational sins. We've also looked at generational blessings. And through this process, over the last few weeks, we've uh, begin to deal with our past. We've begun to look at what it looks like for us to examine uh, the dysfunctional aspects of our family of origin. And that has caused us to come face to face with, um, with dysfunctions. It's caused us to come face to face with hurts. Um, it has caused us to come face to face with people um, that we ultimately need to forgive. Last week, we talked dealt with um, the increasing of our faith and the fact that we all need an increased measure of faith if we are to forgive. This week specifically, we want to press in a little further because I realize that going through this process, that there's not just people that I need to forgive, but I need to change my mentality. I need to change my mindset. I need to change the way that I think about um, God because how you view God is how you love God. And if there is an ought in your spirit, in your mind against God, ultimately it's going to hinder the way that you love God. The Bible says that we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and and strength. But my brothers and sisters, friends and family, what I realize as a person, as a human, not as a pastor or a leader, but what I realize as a person, as a as just as a human is my view and my perspective of an individual determines and it dictates how I love that individual how a person treats me, how a person allows certain things to transpire in my life. It dictates and it determines how I view that person and it dictates and determines my love for that person. And I want to encourage you all to think about that when it comes to your love for God. The question is, brothers and sisters, do you need to forgive God? Is there something in your mind? Has there something in your past that has caused you to not love God? Is there something in your past? Is there something in your narrative script? Is there something that has been said or something that has been done that has caused you to build a wall that needs to be torn down with regards to God? You need to forgive God. The baby that you've always dreamed of and you prayed about and that never came, you're holding that in your heart against God and now you need to find yourself in the posture and in the position to forgive God. Maybe you prayed for an engagement ring to come and the engagement ring never came, you need to find in your heart and in your posture a place to forgive God. You prayed for a loved one to be healed. You prayed for your father who was on his deathbed to be healed. Instead, God did not heal your father. Instead, your father passed away. And you are now, brothers and sisters, as you are watching this particular message, you are disappointed with God. You are mad at God. And you have a frustration in your heart about God. You want to trust God, but it's way, way too difficult. It's way too hard for you to trust God. How can you trust God when you can't trace God? How can you trust God? How can you trust God? Today, brothers and sisters, we want to talk about forgiving God. Now, let me just pause and parenthetically and theologically in state, there is no way for you to forgive God because God does not sin. Because God is sinless, there is no reason for us to be able to forgive God. Therefore, God cannot cause an offense. So if God can't cause an offense, there is no way we can forgive God. But in a real practical sense, um, Paul says that we should renew our minds and it is our mind. It is the ways of the world. It is the ways that we think that ultimately can hinder us from truly trusting God because of things that have transpired in my life. We've already said that we're born in sin, shaped in iniquity, and we all live in a fallen state of humanity. And because of that, friends, we have to learn how to forgive. So specifically today, we want to talk about forgiving God and what does that look like. In our passage of scripture today, we're going to look at a story of a man named Elkanah. 
His name literally means God has created a son. Now, he was married to two individuals, Hannah and Paniah. Hannah couldn't conceive mostly um, uh, during their marriage. She couldn't conceive at all. Uh, and uh, the other wife, Penina, could. And so there was this rivalry that was there. Hannah couldn't bear any children, and she was a failure in the eyes of Penina. She was a failure in the eyes of society at that time. She was ashamed. She was useless in her own eyes. And she was useless in the eye of Penina. Each year, Elkanah would take his family to a place called Shiloh. It was the place of worship. It was the place of sacrifice. Penina took opportunity each and every year to throw shade at Hannah. You mean to tell me you still can't give him a child? You mean to tell me you still can't give forth a child? These are the types of things that happen. These are narrative scripts that cause us in our lives bitterness. It causes us to be bitter at people and not just people, situations and not just situations at God because because we've prayed, and I'm pretty sure that Hannah had already been praying year after year after year after year. Lord, please open up my womb. Let me give forth and uh, give forth birth to a son or to a child. But yet God had not answered her prayer. And so those things, those narrative scripts, the things that Penina was saying about her, the things that Penina was saying to her, those are narrative scripts. They create a script for her, created a script for her to exist in. But yet, in verse number six, Penina, as we look at the text, the text says it, she would taunt Hannah and make her fun of her because the Lord had kept her from giving children or giving birth to a child year after year. Year after year, year after year, and I know you have been frustrated. I know you've been there before. Year after year, year after year, Penina would taunt Hannah. She would taunt her. She would taunt her. Now, Hannah is this sweet, godly little girl, godly woman. Penina is this, you know, hellion, this hood rat, <laughs> this, this woman that just keeps on being cruel and vicious, I mean, she's just mean for no reason, just mean, mean, mean. Why would God bless Penina with children and not Hannah? God could have given Hannah a child, couldn't he? Why, why wouldn't he just give her the child? Maybe you're just like that and you're saying, I'm the faithful one. I'm sweet. I'm a good person. I'm loving I honor people. I honor my mother. I honor my father. I honor God. Why wouldn't God give me that which I want? Hannah prayed and she believed, but yet she waited. She prayed and she believed, but yet she waited. She prayed, brothers and sisters, friends and family, but yet she waited. She prayed and waited. Prayed, believed, and waited. Year after year, nothing. Year after year, nothing. Year after year, nothing. Maybe you can relate. Year after year, nothing. Year after year, you've prayed for that friend to get saved. Yet, year after year, Nothing. Year after year, you've been praying for this particular person in your oikos, for that person to get saved. Yet, year after year, nothing. Year after year, you've asked God for a healing. Year after year, you've asked God for help with your weight. But yet, nothing. Year after year, you've asked God to help you with your anger. Yet, nothing. You're in the same condition as you've always been. In the same condition as you've always been. Year after year, you've begged for that depression to go away. But yet, year after year, it's still here. You fight every day with that issue. You fight every day with that barrenness. You fight every day with that brokenness. You fight every day with that bitterness. But yet, the trial just won't go away. The marriage is still bad. You're still financially struggling. You still have more month than money. You still feel alone. You've prayed and you've cried. You've prayed, you've believed, and you've waited where are you, God, is the question that you ask even as you watch this podcast, even as you watch this weekly message. Where are you, God, and why haven't you, God, 
done anything about my situation? Why, God, did you leave me in that abusive relationship? Why, God, did you leave me in a relationship? Why, God, did you allow me to be born to a father who would speak negative things to me? Why, God, would you allow me to be born to a mother who never affirmed me or never loved me or who never cared for me? Why? I don't get it. And now, God, I can't trust you. And now, God, I don't even like you. Why? Because you've placed me in this posture and in this position to where I'm experiencing such hardship and such hatred in my life. God, in your eyes, needs to be Forgiven, and, and we want to help you through that. That's the whole purpose of dealing with this type of subject because some of you who are watching, you wouldn't normally admit that you need to forgive God. You wouldn't normally admit that you are in a heart posture and in a position to where you don't even trust God, yet you worship God, but you don't even trust him. So it suggests to me that your worship isn't even for real. You, 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 you claim God, but yet you don't even submit to God. So it com suggests to me that you're really not even following. And so as we deal with this, as we deal with the trials that just won't seem to go away, as we deal with it, as we ask the question, where are you, God? Why haven't you, God? Why haven't you delivered me? Why haven't you healed me? Why haven't you healed the situation? Why haven't you given me the child? I still feel alone. Do you even care? Prayed, believed, I've waited. I've prayed, I've believed, I've waited. The husband, Elkanah, generally in this passage, looked at as a good dude. He loves his wife, but he asked her a stupid question. He loves her, and this suggests that you can love your wife and still ask some stupid questions. He says in verse number nine, then Hannah arose, or uh, verse number eight, he says, then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep and why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not better to you than ten sons? He loved his wife. Concerned question, but it was a stupid question. Am I not better to you than ten sons? He, that means he didn't understand her hurt. He didn't understand her narrative script. He didn't understand what she was dealing with, what she was processing, and he only added another layer of hurt. Then when we look at the very next verse, he, he asked her this. He asked her this question, but then as we get to the next verse, we, we understand that I believe it only provoked her to be more bitter, to be more broken. As a result of her barrenness, her husband asked her this question, am I not better to you than ten sons? Why are you downtrodden? Why are you downhearted just because you can't have any children? You have me is what he says. This is ultimately what he's saying. You have me. Isn't I better? Aren't I better than having ten sons? This is what he asked her. Hannah's trying to love. She's trying to love God. And one thing that she wants, God seems to withhold from her. She's trying to love. She's trying to love God. And the one thing that she wants, God is seemingly withholding from her. Let me say it again. She's trying to love. She's trying to love God. And the one thing that she asked of God, God seems to withhold from her. I'm trying to love. I'm trying to love God. All I wanted was a job, God, and it seems like you're going to withhold from me a job? I'm trying to love. I'm trying to love you, God, and all I want is a marriage, and you seem to hold that from me? I'm trying to love. I'm trying to love you, oh God, and it seems like all you're going to withhold from me is the ability to provide for my family. I'm trying to love, and those types of things causes you to have some bitterness towards God. Be honest. Say amen. Because I know I'm not the only one who's ever been bitter towards God. I know I'm not the only one that has found myself in a posture and in a position to where I was frustrated and wanting to throw in the towel in my relationship with regards to God. I mean, I have been ready to be done. 
And this is why I'm saying, this is why I'm suggesting to all who have tuned in to this week's message, we have to understand that in our minds, how we view God is how we love God. And if we believe that just because God denied or even delayed a particular blessing, God doesn't love us, we are sadly mistaken because sometimes the blessing will be delayed. Sometimes a blessing could be denied, but it does not mean that God does not love us. Now, I know you wanted to hear that blessings delayed are not blessings denied, and it is because that's what we've always been told. But what just if the blessing is delayed and and the blessing is denied. Do you still think that God doesn't love you? He loved you so much that he gave a son to die on the cross for you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died. So who are we to think that God is a cosmic Coke machine? Who are we to think that God is a genie in the bottle? Just because we make a request does not mean that God has the right to answer said request. Hannah, as we see in the text, she unloaded on God. And I just want to suggest to you that it may be all right for you to unload on God. Maybe, just maybe, that's where you are. Maybe, just maybe, that's where you need to be. You find yourself in verse number 9 of 1 Samuel chapter number 1. You are in verse number 9. Once after a, sacrifice, a sacrificial meal at Shiloh, Hannah got up. And she went to pray. Eli, the priest, was sitting at his customary place beside the entrance of the tabernacle. Hannah was in deep anguish. She cried bitterly as she prayed to the Lord. She unloaded on God. She was in deep anguish. She cried bitterly as she prayed, as she unloaded on God. You see, she pours out her heart on God. And I just want to tell you that God can handle your pouring out. He can, unhand he can handle your unloading. God understands your pain. He understands your frustration. He welcomes your questions. Rather than have you yell at him, he would, uh, rather than have you walk away, he would rather you have him yell at him than have you walk away. Hannah, who was in deep anguish, Hannah, who cried bitterly, Hannah, unloaded on God. And may I suggest today that this just may be a week for you to cry bitterly and pray unto God so that you can find a place in your heart for forgiving of other people and forgiving God in your mind. Remember, he does not sin, therefore he cannot offend so therefore, you and I don't have the car blanche, the right or the liberty to forgive him. But we do have the right to adjust our minds, to transform our minds, to renew our minds, to change our perspective and our thoughts about God and about how we view God. She pours out her heart to God. And I want to suggest an even imply today that you need to find yourself this week pouring out your heart to God. Just let God know how you feel. Say, hey, God. Hey, 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 God. Hey, Dad, this is how I feel. You got to find yourself pouring out in deep anguish. Hannah tells God, give me a son. Give me a son and I'll give him back to you. As she prays, the priest, Eli, falsely accuses her of being drunk. And she says, no, my Lord, I'm, I'm not drunk. After he falsely accuses her and tells her to throw away her wine, she says, no, my Lord, I'm not drunk. I'm just praying out of deep anguish. I'm praying out of deep sorrow. I'm not drunk. I'm just broken as a result of my barrenness. I'm just broken and I'm tired of being bitter. Are you at a point and a place of tired of being bitter? I'm at a place and I'm at a point in time in my life to where I'm tired of being bitter. I'm tired of carrying relational patterns. I'm tired of carrying generational sins. I'm tired of carrying the narrative scripts 
that don't line up with the purpose. I'm tired of carrying and dealing with scandalons and bent sticks that try to impede my progress to purpose. I'm tired of dealing with those things. I want to suggest to you to find yourself like Hannah found herself in a prayer closet, deeply anguished, crying out to God, God, help me. Give me a son and I'll give him back to you. Whatever it is that you need from God, ask of God and tell him that you will give it back to him. You need a job, sir? Tell him, give me a job and I'll give it back to you. But this time when you get it, don't, don't, don't shade God because last time he gave you a job and you shaded God. Last time he answered that prayer and you shaded him. Last time he set you free and you shaded him. Hannah says, give it to me and I'll give him back to you. Give it to me and I'll give it back to you. Give me peace and I'll give you back peace. Give me joy and I'll give it back to you. Give me a job, I'll give it back to you. Give me a marriage and I'll give that marriage back to you. Whatever it is that you've been asking God for, make sure that you'll give it back to him. In the request, the priest Eli now says, go in peace, my daughter. May God grant your request. May, may God grant your request. Now I want you to see the blessing of the priest here because it was the blessing of the priest but it was also the response of the person. She says, no my Lord. After she was falsely accused, she says, no my Lord. I'm not drunk. I'm just praying out of deep anguish and sorrow. He then says, I grant you or go in peace. May God grant you your request. Still, she got nothing. Here it is. Y'all need to see this in the text. Still, she got nothing. She prayed from a posture of humility. She prayed from a posture of brokenness. She prayed from a posture of deep anguish and bitterness. She cries out bitterly. But yet, the priest says, go in peace. May God grant you your request. Still, she got nothing. Still has to go home and deal with the hood rat Panina. Still, she goes home and her husband still may say something stupid. God still hadn't answered your prayer, Hannah? God still hasn't answered her prayer. There's still no sign of a prayer being answered. She continues to hold on to her faith. Brothers and sisters, when God doesn't answer your prayer, will you still hold on to your faith? We see in the text today, the priest says, go in peace. May God grant you your prayer request. Go in peace. May God grant you your prayer request. Go in peace. May God grant you your prayer request. That's all the way. And 9, 10, but as we get all the way to verse number 19, between 10 and 19, I want you all to read that in your own times. In verse number 19, the Bible says that the entire family got up early the next morning and went to worship. She continues to hold on to her faith and she doesn't let it go. You see, when God doesn't answer prayers in our lives, typically what we do is we quit God. We throw in the towel. Hannah holds on to her faith. The next morning she got up and she went to worship the Lord once more. When God doesn't answer your prayer, will you stop attending movement meetups? When God doesn't answer your prayer, will you stop actually being connected in Christian community? When God doesn't answer your prayer, what will your response be? A waited season is not a wasted season. A waiting season should not be a wasted season. What did she do? The next day she went and she worshiped. And so as you are waiting, I've said this time and time again, please worship. As we've been waiting for the country to reopen, please worship. Now watch this. You may not be able to worship with your hands lifted, but you can worship by practicing slowing silence and solitude. You can worship by actually connecting to Jesus. You can worship that way, spending time with him, fasting, prayer, scripture memorization, meditation, meditating on his word day and night. This is the way that you worship God. Move up to connect to Christ. 
this is what you do. A waited season should not be a wasted season. What have you been doing over the last 60 days? What have you been doing over the last 65 days? A waiting season should not be a wasted season. She waited for God to bless her. She waited for God to answer her prayer, but she did not waste that season. She worshiped while she waited. God's delays, again, brothers and sisters, are not necessarily God's denials, but what if they are? You still got to let go of the hurt. You still have to find yourself renewing your mind and saying, I choose to still trust you, God. I choose to still trust you, God. I choose to still trust you, God. I may still be waiting but I'm still gonna trust you. I can't trace you, but I'm still going to trust you. I still may be waiting, but I'm trusting while I wait. I'm gonna lift my hands. I'm going to practice slowing silence and solitude. I'm gonna spend time with Jesus even while I wait. And even though I still have a desire, my desire for him is greater than the desire that I have for me because it's not about my thoughts. It's not about my ways. It's about his thoughts and it's about his ways. And so, brothers and sisters, we want to remind you. We want to encourage you this week. We, we want you to find in your time of slowing silence and solitude, we want you to find in your time this week, this week, we want you to find time to press in. We want you to find time to forgive God. We hope the words from our pastors inspired you. We hope it builds your faith and gives you the perspective to see how the gospel can truly transform your life. If this church movement has been a blessing to you and you'd like to support this ministry financially, you can do so online and help us bring messages just like this one to you each week. Hey, thanks again. We are Movement and we are the church. For more info, log on to our website or follow us on Instagram at movementchurch.tv.